need for speed and big plays at the wide receiver position. That's what we're talking about as we take a look at the Bills' pass catchers at the wide receiver spot right now. I'm Kevin Carroll. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast. As we continue our offseason outlook at each position group on the Bills, what they have, what they're potentially losing, and, and what direction they need to go to get better. And I think wide receiver is going to be the most talked about spot on the entire Bills roster over the next coming months through free agency and the draft because it was clear as the season moved along they were not what we thought they would be at that position for a second straight season and the moves that have been made over the past few years to try to elevate it haven't really worked out. So what direction does Brandon Bean go, understanding the financial restrictions he's dealing with, Bruh. to bolster a position group that is probably also the most important on the team when you have a quarterback the caliber of Josh Allen? And the buzzword or phrase going into the offseason when talking about the wide receiver position is to get a player that Josh Allen can throw to that would make big splash plays, big highlight plays that this team has just been lacking for the last few years. I mean, Stefan Diggs is great and all, John, but we have yet to really see, other than Gabe Davis in the 13 seconds game a few years ago, someone who was just able to make that big play down the field. And I think, honestly, the conversation here could start with Stefan Diggs himself because Absolutely. you or we would always talk about, all right, who's going to be the compliment? Who's going to be the true number two to Stefan Diggs? Who's going to take the onus off of him? Meanwhile, since mid-October, as we've said repeatedly on every single show I think we've done over the past month and a half, Stefan Diggs did not have a 100-yard receiving game since mid-October. He did not look, perform, and certainly was not producing and being involved like all pro, Superman, top tier, without question, number one wide receiver that Stephon Diggs had been the first six weeks of this past season and certainly the previous three years. Yeah, he's going to the Pro Bowl as an alternate because Amari Cooper is is not going to be able to play. It In totality, 1,183 yards, eight touchdowns, 107 receptions, like, that's a sensational season. But you can't look at it in totality. You have to look at it chunk. Then what the heck is happening here? And the Bills aren't moving on from Stefan Diggs. Financially, it's impossible. Even if we go through the charades that we did a year ago in the offseason of how does Diggs feel about his place on the team? I don't think we need to talk about it. It's not going to happen. But from a on-the-field perspective... They have to figure out what the hell happened, why it happened, and how can they change course because I personally do not believe it was as simple as, oh, Stephon Diggs is older now, he's 30, he's not going to be an elite number one anymore. I, I just don't believe that's the case. He disappeared at times, Well, which is interesting in its own right, John. When the Bills had to win games to stay in the playoff hunt is when Stephon Diggs all but disappeared. You know, the lasting image this year is going to be him unable to catch a pass deep down the field from Josh Allen in the playoff loss to the Chiefs. The year before was him trying to storm out of the building before McDermott had a chance to address the team after the loss to the Bengals. Um, that led to all of last offseason's shenanigans. This year, I'm sure there'll be questions again with how the season played out and how a guy who's one of the most sure-handed guys I've ever seen play football doesn't come down with a ball that Josh Allen basically put in his hands that there are just questions around the guy and in, in what happened during the season or what happened leading up to this past season because everything looked fine early on and then – it's incredible when the team needed him the most how he wasn't there. And like you pointed out during the season, he wasn't even on the field 
sometimes. And when you're trying to look at the Bills room, wide receiver room as a whole, if you truly do not believe Stephon Diggs is still a number one wide receiver, that also dictates the path that you have to go on because it's always been, here's the number one, now we backfill from there. But if you as an organization, which I don't believe that they think this, and I don't believe it either, but if there's any inkling of a thought of we have to start baking in the natural regression for a player who's 31, then there's even more of a need to flush this position group with talent. It can't just be, oh, we'll, we'll go through the draft and have to rely on a first-round pick to be impactful immediately. That's why they got Stefan Diggs, because they didn't feel years ago they were in this window and had the time frame to wait right. for the development of a young player to be instantly impactful. To me, they're going to have to go and address this this group on different levels with significant investments, especially in the draft. But if, if it's, well, Stefan's maybe more of a 1B than a 1A already at 31, then you're even looking at it and you're saying, well, do they need to take whatever very little money that they have and pay for some guys as well? I, I think their evaluation of Stefan Diggs is going to be critical to how the rest of that position group and their plan of attack stacks out. Yeah, and when we talked about the running back position, we talked about how behind James Cook, it's pretty empty at this point going in. And you look at the fact that Gabe Davis, John, more than likely gone. I would say I'd feel comfortable at saying 98% he's not in a Buffalo Bills uniform next year. I think Trent Sherfield turned out to be not what the Bills thought that they were getting. Um, Deontay Hardy, I was never a fan of. I know everyone was. And he's still technically under contract. Right. Um, Khalil Shakir, a pleasant surprise. Shorter is what, from last year's draft? A day three later guy who was highly recruited out of high school, never panned out in college, lost for the entire year with an injury. He's got size, he's got speed, but what is he? Like, you right. just, you really can't, you could put him in the mix as, hey, this guy could round out the roster as wide receiver five or six, but I think it would be negligent for anyone to bake into their plans for this group to say Justin Shorter should be some sort of a contributor. I just I feel yeah. like that would be a poor path to go on. With Hardy, let's just start there. Well, no, I'll, I lied. Ooh. I'll start with Gabe Davis. I just feel for all parties involved, it's, it's time to split. I feel like... Maybe he wishes he had a bigger role. I think maybe they wish he was more consistent. And for the market value, I think Spot Track has him at is 13, 14 mil. No way. No way for a team strapped with cap can you justify paying that to a guy that I'm sorry, you know who he is. At this point, I'm not saying he can't get better. Right. But you've seen it for four years. You know who he is as a player, especially in this offense, in this group. And it's not all on Gabe for why it didn't take off after the 13-second game and, and become what people thought he should and would become. I think he wants more out of his role. I think it's, yeah, it's a great compliment. And he told me this when I sat down with him late in the year. It's a compliment, and he understands the respect, the team, the coaching staff, everyone has for him as a blocker. But catching the football is what a receiver does. Right. And he has inconsistencies with that. He also wasn't given opportunities. And I'm sure, and I do know, there's people who dive into the film who will tell you it's because last year it was because his routes were too deep, which is true. So the percentages of completing those are lower than those. And then I just think maybe he does not create the separation that you need, especially from a number two receiver. If he's slotted as a three or four like he was early in his time with the Bills, I think maybe it's a different story. But you can't pay, especially in their cap situation, $13, 14000000 million or even $10 million yeah. for a guy who produces like what Gabe Davis has over his time once elevated into that number two role. So I think for all parties involved, 
it's good that he will probably move on. And with Deontay Hardy, he has a $5.5 plus million dollar cap hit. They can save just over four if they get rid of him, they release him, and 1.375 dead cap. You don't love it, but if you don't think, if you're looking for money, and Brandon Bean's talking about, if I'm spending two and a half million on a guy, they have to contribute like a two and a half million. Like I can't miss on two and a half mil. What did you see out of Deontay Hardy that would make you believe that it'll be better to justify five and a half million as a cap hit this coming season? Like I said, I was. I remember going into this past season and. Yeah, Hardy's the return guy, and we saw what he did. He helped them beat the Miami Dolphins for sure. But as far as in the passing game and in his role as a wide receiver, it never took for me. I didn't see how it was going to. With what the Bills had out there on the field, a shorter, speedier wide receiver, I didn't. it didn't move the needle for me for what this Bills – offense needed I I didn't see it I didn't like it and I'm not saying I was right and it panned out the way I thought it would but it just never did it for me when the buzz was all there like wait till you see what the bills are going to do with Deontay Hardy nothing and it's disappointing because we were in agreement watching him at training camp we were blown away by his juice his explosiveness his suddenness his speed just look at the con the construction of what they do have, we know. Diggs on the outside as your one. Khalil Shakir is definitely your slot. Yeah. So then where's Deontay Hardy fitting in? He's at worst, he should, he's probably your four. Is be, I should say at best, he's your four. Well, what is the role for a four? And he certainly should not have a role as a four at five and a half million bucks right. when you can save over four. So I, I think really – then when you look at this Bills room, it's going to be Stefan Diggs, Khalil Shakir, and then like Andy Isabella's coming back on a futures contract. K.J. Hamler is a guy that Bean referenced in his end-of-season remarks, a former high draft pick who has this explosive big play ability, but it never worked out for Denver, some injuries and things like that. That's a good flyer to take on a guy that, according to Spot Track, is about a mil. Okay. So that that's good. The big talking point, McDermott, Bean, at the end of the season was explosive plays. Guys that, that can, you know, you're not doing these methodical drives. You need to hit some of these these big plays. Hardy, in theory, should be that guy. I just don't see that as the role. So now you're moving down the list of like, all right, let's just start with free agency because that's first. They're not going to be able to afford to pay Mike Evans. <laughs> like, I liked that idea earlier. They just yeah. don't have the money. Odell Beckham, what did you see in Baltimore consistently that would make you want to invest any sort of money that he's going to He's garner? a guy that disappeared at times. Like, watching the NF- the AFC championship game. He wasn't even targeted till the second half. Right. So, uh, I don't think that panned out exactly how Baltimore saw it. And, uh, 35 I did- catches for 565 and three touchdowns. Like, if you're paying Odell Beckham at 32, 5 mil, I can get there for that type of production. I still think he could be effective, but uh, let's see what uh, Spot Track has his market value at 12. Like, I'm not paying Odell Beckham 12 right. to do something like that. I mean, the other ones, Curtis Samuel, no. I'm an Ohio State guy. I've seen what Curtis Samuel is in the NFL. He doesn't stay healthy, and he's not this gadget, do-it-all guy consistently that he was deemed to be. Now, Kendrick Bourne, I kind of like him, but I just don't think the market value is under five. All right. That's a guy that I think I could could get with, but I don't think he at the same time necessarily satisfies this idea of he can – really create separation and and big plays and all this stuff. But he's someone that at 28 will be 29 next season. I've liked what I've seen from him in terms of his production in Kansas Kansas City, New England. England, Yeah. But but that's the type of range. Like you're going to have to go for $5 million guys. And that's where it's this, if you're going to look to to add someone who really provides juice from the jump, it's going to have to be 
putting your eggs in the basket of a rookie in a high first, second round pick. So I think where I'm looking at, like I look at Kendrick Bourne, DJ Shark, uh, Marquise Brown still out there, T. Higgins uh, a little bit further down. Um, but then making a move to even trade up in the draft to get your big hitter, new explosive wide receiver, but bring in a guy like Kendrick Bourne who – is proven in the NFL that he can deliver. I I remember a few years ago, he led the Patriots in receiving and no one even knew it. Like Patriots fans really didn't know his name. And when you said to them, well, Kendrick Bourne, who's he? Isn't he like the number four wide receiver? Well, maybe in name recognition wise, but he was really good. Um, so I could see doing that and then just, Doing what you can to move up. Like, I still think they should have moved up to get Flowers, who ended up going to Baltimore. Like, that was big. You and I talked about that going into the draft. That uh, And Flowers ended up having a really big role with the Ravens, showing that you can get a guy in the first round and have him have an impact in your season. He was everything Jordan Reed of ESPN told us he was going to be in the NFL, which is why Jordan, his guess at the combine, which he's always so good at, was Zay Flowers to the Bills as the perfect fit. It's because he is this incredible route runner with explosiveness that can get open and make it easier for Josh Allen by creating separation, and then on top of it can then turn a short gain to big, big plays. Mm -hmm. Jordan Addison, another guy that I think showcased that as a rookie with the Minnesota Vikings as well. The Bills aren't going to be able to afford Mike Evans. They're not going to be able to afford Marquise Brown, Calvin Ridley, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman. They're not in that that group. So Kendrick Bourne is probably your best case option of getting someone that you have seen be productive somewhere that can hopefully do that. And But is that what you're hoping to rely on as your number two? Like, if you go into next season and you're like, okay, Stefan Diggs, Kendrick Bourne, Khalil Shakir, some rookie first or second round pick, Justin Shorter, maybe Andy Isabella, D- KJ Hamler or something, is that good for you? I, I don't know if that's what will make you feel the most comfortable, but that just may be the reality of the situation. And you talk about we can transition now to the draft. I've been on the wide receiver train. I know Jeremy White likes to say he's on it, too. He's been leading it, and I agree. I love it. We've been on it for years. This year, though, I I think you don't want to reach for it just because it's such a big need. But I agree with you. I think they should have been aggressive in the past couple years. Of course, it's this double-edged sword of, well, look at these first-round receivers, but look at the second-round guys. Do you need to reach for them knowing – how the value of the position, it's so deep. Are people going to be up in arms if they draft a safety in the first round at, yeah, 20, they, at, yes. at 28 <laughs> and then go receiver in the next round? I don't know because that's a need as well. The Bills, that's, we'll go draft that's like months down the way, but I right. just I want to prepare people. The Bills have a lot of holes, and while wide receiver is certainly one of them, and offense is something that people often feel has been neglected by the Bills in the offseason, I would push back on that from last year with Kincaid and Osiris Torrance and Hardy and Sherfield and things like that. But they got a lot of holes on the defensive side of things that need to be addressed that uh, I think you can't just say it's only wide receiver or bust in round one. Um, I think safety and defensive line are, are heavily in the mix as well. No, I get it. I just – and, again, ultimately they end up with Dalton Kincaid. He was decent. Uh had some big catches down the stretch. I just – I think it's time. I don't think you can just sit there and hope someone falls to you in the second round. I think if you're within striking distance of getting a wide receiver in the first round that you feel can make an immediate impact on the team, I think you have way more confidence in doing it there in the first round than hoping to get something in the second round and – uh, 
Oh man, I was gonna. You said something in one of our earlier podcasts that I was gonna bring up about either moving up or. Well, I'll say that I'll just I'll I'll push you into this direction. We had the conversation on some pods of the DeAndre Hopkins conversation was hot and heavy in the off season. Right. The Bills ultimately sink ten, which I think incentives maybe twelve million into Leonard Floyd. I thought Floyd actually was the right move the way things played out. In a similar situation, with knowing where the Bills roster is now, let's say they can spend 10 to 12. Would you rather them spend it this year, knowing the way the roster is, in a month, in March or whatever? Should they spend 10 to 12 on a pass catcher or a wide receiver, or would you rather them invest that into another pass rusher? Wide receiver. 100% wide receiver. It's just, to me, I have this feeling that opportunities are being missed by this team by not focusing on getting a legitimate wide receiver to run opposite Stephon Diggs. I think they're just at a point where it's everything else we have tried to do just hasn't been quite enough. So let's just do it. This time, let's get someone in. Let's through the draft, through free agency, and just get this pass catching unit. Like you said, you have Dalton Kincaid, you still have Dawson Knox. Get players out there that are going to get you to that next level where defenses are going to be like, all right, we can't just focus on Stefan Diggs anymore. So you're saying. As we run through the rest of these position groups and, and give the out, off-season outlook, you think if they're going to do any sort of significant spending, so I'll say ten plus million, we'll yep. go ten to ten to twelve million. That one sizable move in free agency should be on a wide receiver. Yes, above any other position. Above any okay. other position. Okay, I, I'm. I don't necessarily disagree. I don't necessarily. You know, I don't want to pay. I don't think they should pay Kendrick Bourne or DJ Chark ten to twelve million. Uh, but, we can agree on but, that. Uh, and they're certainly not going to be in the running, like I said, for some of these other guys. But I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe they could maneuver some things at the cap and get Marquise Brown. I, that's a guy that's been so inconsistent. But who knows? That's that's a blow the top off the the defense type of guy. I, I just I don't see them in the running for those types of guys. So um, we'll have to see. But it would be interesting. If a year after investing heavily into the offense, whether it be draft picks and maybe not as much money because they didn't have it, but Connor McGovern was also technically an offensive addition and mm-hmm. things like that, if they would make their most sizable spending on the open market a wide receiver as well as a first or second round pick on a wide receiver. Got to do it. I'm not disagreeing. I it's, mean, it's- it's time. I mean, give me a break. Where are we now? Going into 2024? Come on. What, what's been. I always think back to. I think it was. Was it the AFC Championship game when Josh was still kind of young? But you had Beasley in place. You had John Brown to be opposite Stefan Diggs the following year. Gabe made, Davis was. That was the year he was a four. Right. And then the following year, you had Emmanuel Sanders as the guy, the veteran, while Gabe Davis was still in his same spot and Beasley was still in. Get there. Get get to that point again with the pass-catching unit where you have another name that you look at when you're seeing the Bills starters who's out there like, oh, man, you got Diggs there, you got – DJ Shark on the other side, and you got Shakir in the slot, and Dalton Kincaid out there. That's going to be something that defenses are going to have issues with. I don't disagree. When you have Josh Allen, you, in my opinion, need to always, above anything else in the team, make sure he is surrounded by the most and best talent that you can to make his job even easier. You know he can make any throw. So find guys that can get open, even if it's a little sliver, to allow him to maximize his talents. And also get those chunk plays. We did not see 
chunk plays, and that's maybe also we hear it all the time, whether it was Dable or Dorsey or or Joe Brady. It's hard to go ten plays eighty yards. They mm-hmm. did it. It's a heck of a lot easier to go ten plays seventy five yards two three times twice in a game, and then boom, pop. These right. 50, 60 yarders, they were there with Diggs a couple times and Josh missed them. But even if it's, hey, let's not go 10, let's go 6 and 75, and it's because you're getting a 35-yarder or a 40-yarder or a 20, couple 25-yarders. That's as much on the quarterback, but I think it's also, hey, the wide receivers need to get open. Yeah, it just seems like that was lacking the last couple of seasons for me. You always, when you looked at it, with who they had out there on the field, didn't feel confident. I mean, heck, they brought John Brown and Beasley back (laughs) two years ago. Yeah, we'll see. And so I would ask, we're going to keep moving into pass catchers moving forward here. We're going to move to tight ends, which there's not as much uncertainty in terms of what they're going to do. Pretty much everyone is already here, but I think it's then going to transition to, do you have to rework a contract for Dawson Knox? How does this fit? What do they do there? And... Well, maybe that one might be one of our more quicker ones. As you're here on YouTube, (laughs) like, subscribe, comment. I think you guys probably are going to have a lot to say in terms of our thoughts on the wide receiver position and others. So uh, keep them coming, and we'll keep rolling through the week. Yeah, position, groups, we'll get to it all. Offensive line should be interesting because I don't know what I have to say about offensive line. (laughs) All right, as always, everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll see you down the road.